So today we are um, thinking about Jesus and one of the statements he made. Before we do that, um, down at the front, the kids are going to be working on uh, a little craft uh, and they are making gardens. Uh, and in the gardens, they have got um, stones, which are going to use to be making a path. We're going to be creating crosses out of, oh, look, we've got a little model, out of um, lollipop sticks and weave. And then also they're going to be looking at um, some Bible verses to speak truth over their lives. And at the end, they're going to come and share with us what they've done um, as a way of helping us reflect on what we're thinking about. Shall we just pray for a moment before I start talking? (laughs) Father, we just want to say thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we can open it freely in this country. Thank you that we have the privilege to sit here openly. And before we dive into your word, we want to lift up our brothers and sisters around the world today who do not have this privilege. We should count ourselves so blessed to be here. And so would you give them strength this morning as they gather? Would you speak through your word to them powerfully that they may be the lights that you have called them to be in their situations, that they may grow stronger in their faith with you? And Lord, as we come to here today, would you speak deeply into our hearts? that we would draw hope from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple of quotes. Uh, Maybe person next to you, have a little chat, see if you know who said, to infinity and beyond. Anybody shout it out? Buzz Buzz Lightyear, well done. There he is. Okay, next one. Who said this? Just keep swimming. Hands up, anybody know? Go on, Pam. Dory, well done. I didn't know if people knew that one. How about this one? Some people, it's nice, some people are just worth melting for. Go on. It was Olaf. Yes, well done, Evie. Fantastic. Switch it up a little bit now. Go on. Martin Luther King. Well done. Good knowledge. Okay, who said this? And I realize it's ironic that in a statement about being intelligent, I've typed it up wrong. I am intelligent. Some people would say, I am very, very, very intelligent. Was it your husband? No, it wasn't. (laughs) It was. It was Donald Trump. Well done, Gordon. Good stuff. What a guy. What do you think about that one? Okay, let's see who knows this one. Muhammad Ali, well done. There he is, the greatest ever. And then we have this statement from Jesus, who said, you're going to say Jesus, weren't you? It was <laughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life. Big statement. And in fact, maybe reading it today, we might say, well, that's a little bit big-headed in today's day and age. Maybe it sounds a bit similar to Donald Trump and Muhammad Ali than it does Olaf or um, Dory. Lovely, uh, like warm statements contrasted with something like this. Maybe in the 21st century today, we can appreciate that we have possibly advanced a little bit more than Jesus' time. 
Maybe we could say things like, actually, shouldn't Jesus be saying, really, today, I am our way, our truth, and our life? Maybe the word of today is that there are many paths that lead to God, and so surely Jesus is just one of those ways. Don't all paths lead to the same God? Perhaps a different way Jesus could have said it, or may have said it, in today's day and age is, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. Because actually, doesn't that sound like some of the messages we hear today, which say things like, believe in yourself. Don't you change for anybody. What about be your own light? Be your own truth. See, these messages are great messages in some ways. But what happens if we take that message of being our own way, our own truth, and our own life, and a situation comes in our life that we are unable to deal with? Don't change for anybody sounds great until you get into a relationship or a marriage where actually you very quickly realize that if you don't start changing and compromising, that relationship is never going to thrive. Life doesn't come as a one-size-fits-all package for us. Maybe we wish sometimes it came with like an Ikea set of instructions. But there's really no way to predict the future. There's really no way to know what is coming next. And the trouble, I think, with some of these messages that we hear is that they can lead us to feel like we are more in control than we really are. Like we need to be more in control of things than we really are. And so today I remember, I remember doing a lot of spending time with some of the kids uh, and the youth in the school and I used to do quite a lot of mentoring with them. And what you see in a generation today is a generation, generally speaking, who have so much potential but also so much fear. There's so much opportunity and so much anxiety. There is so much good ahead of them, but also so much depression. When Jesus spoke these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was talking with his disciples and this is set in John 14. And he just spent uh, this evening meal with them in the Passover. And he knew his time was coming to an end. He was going very shortly to be captured, to be beaten, to be taken away and to be crucified. And he just set his disciples this example. His last sort of time with them was to wash each other's feet. He said, love one another. And then he breaks the news to them that he's going. And they don't quite understand. They've just been three years with Jesus. This amazing rabbi, teacher, the son of God who they've seen miracles and touch people's lives. And he says they go, he's going. And their hearts, it says in the text, become troubled. Anxious. Worried. Three years and he's leaving. Well, what's next? Where are you going? What happens to me now? We can probably relate to those sorts of questions at times in our life. And Jesus speaks these words. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Into the heart of their troubledness. To bring them comfort. Jesus here is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you don't have to be. I am the way, he says, because you can't be. I am the way because you can't be. Jesus was about to die, to give his life as a way of ransoming the world back to God. To create this open access to God the Father. 
Jesus came that we might have a relationship with God. But that door, the way into a relationship with God had always been broken by people. Uh, recently, I was, um, well, I'm just getting sick of the mess around my house uh, with three kids. It's just, it's just mad. I, like, I didn't realize I was such a clean freak, but I like things to be tidy and ordered. And so I sat out one day and just in my mind, and I said, you know what? I am going to clean up after my kids the whole day. Like, I'm not going to let this room become messy all day in the lounge. And so as soon as Alia took out a book and then finished it and left it there, I picked it up, put it straight back in the bookshelf. Rosa had eaten some food, dropped a little bit on the floor, Hoover straight out, bzz, 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 done. The whole day, buzzing around them, buzzing around them. And I ended up just like following them, following behind them the whole way. And I was getting stressed and anxious. And I was like, don't do that, don't do that. Blah. And Heather just sat me down and said, what are you doing? It's like, what are you doing? Just, they're going to make mess. We'll clean it up later. And I suppose this is a picture in some ways of how our lives can be light without Jesus. There's a struggle, an inner struggle to keep things clean, to keep things open, to have a way between us and God. But the fact that the Bible says is that our sin has caused a barrier. This is a icebreaker ship. They operate in the Arctic and other areas. And what happens is that there are routes for boats that they need to travel along. But these routes become frozen over, impassable. And so these ships are designed with heavy metal sheeting on the front in kind of a wedge formation. And they have stronger engines. And these ships drive through the ice sheets and they break it up. And behind them, they leave a path for the other ships to travel. See, Jesus knew he was about to clear the way for mankind. Open a new way for people to know God in a new way like people had never known God before. It had been blocked by our mess, by the way we choose to live our lives in our own way and not in the way that God wanted for us. And so the Bible says he became sin for us and he was killed. Our sin, our mess was killed with Jesus on the cross. And when he came back to life, he showed that death had no power over him. And so access was open to everybody. I am the way is an exclusive statement that might not sit right in today's day and age but it is totally inclusive to every single person in the world. Some of us, maybe we end up just striving for this cleanliness, for this way through. Could be because of our past mentalities. Could be of ways we've grown up. Could be to do with things in our childhood. And it can be tiring. If I could just pray more. If I could just serve more. I will be accepted. But Jesus has come to bring once and for all freedom for every person who would believe in his name from the power of sin. He made the way. He is the way. Jesus said, I am the truth. You know, when we are troubled, we are vulnerable to letting the wrong things speak into our lives. I don't know how many of you know this, but the enemy fights, and there is an enemy. He's very real, and he opposes the good and the love of God throughout the world, and he tries to in our lives as well. And the enemy fights in the mind because he knows that if he can change your mind, he can change your actions. It's in our minds where we form our worldviews. It's in our minds where we form our views of ourself and our identity. 
a Mental Health Foundation survey in 2023 found that out of 6,000 adults surveyed, 60% suffered or found that anxiety interfered with their daily lives. 45% of those kept it a secret because of stigma and shame. There is a battle for your mind that is very real. Let me share just a few ways in which I have felt the enemy try to attack my mind. And you may relate to some of these as well. The first thing is that he will try to confuse you about the truth. It's the oldest trick in the book. Open up your Bibles to the very start of creation in Genesis 3. And the enemy says this in the serpent. Did God really say that? Like, did he really say that? And if he can confuse your mind about what God has been speaking about, then he knows that you are less likely to trust him and to build your truth on him. Genesis and Revelation are probably the two most contested books in Scripture. How many of you have seen Christians fall out over whether or not the world was 6,000 years old or created in a much longer time frame? How many of you would open daily revelation because just all those biblical pictures of visions and, and future just make so much sense and are so easy to read? If he can confuse the first two books, the first book and the last book of our scripture, then he knows that you're not going to have a chance of getting into the meat and bones of the rest of it. You're not going to pick it up. And so he seeks to confuse you about the truth of God. He seeks to distract you and distract me. Why would he need to steal and destroy and spend all this time if he could just simply waste down the clock of your life without you realizing it? If he could just distract you with things of this world and we go off on mouse chase after things. Then we would just be so caught up in living our lives that we miss the things of the kingdom and we become unimpactful. That's a victory for him. The enemy will seek to dilute the message of Jesus. And we can see it today in places so many people when it comes to religion where it's a bit like a pick and mix I love that bit of Buddhism I love that bit of Islam I love those teachings of Jesus and all of a sudden we're mixing and diluting the true message of the gospel oh but Jesus was just a good teacher he had great morals God is a God but he's not the only God if he can dilute the message of the gospel. Oh, Jesus can heal, but he, he really won't heal fully. He'll lead you so far, but he really isn't all powerful and all knowing. And if he's tried to confuse the truth, if he's tried to distract you, if he's then tried to dilute the message, he also tries to deter you. Oh, you know that thing God's speaking to you about, that thing that's on your heart, that is stirring and moving you. Yeah, 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 that might just be a little bit too difficult. I don't think you could do that. You know what? You've got enough on your plate already. Don't try and add something else to it. You know, if you actually start standing up and letting the Holy Spirit transform your life, you're going to be judged by others. You don't want that. You want to fit in. Mm. Now, I think what God's asking you to do is just going to be a little bit too uncomfortable. Let's keep you comfy. Someone said... The truth 
is still the truth, even if no one believes it. And a lie is still a lie, even if everybody does. Lies are powerful. And this is how the enemy gets his way into your life and the life of the church. And he holds back and opposes everything that God wants to be doing in your life and in our life and in the kingdom and in the world. But Romans 12 verse 2 tells us, do not conform though to the patterns of this world. Do not become like picking and mixing truth from all parts, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Before you were a Christian, you thought one way. Before you encountered Jesus and gave your life to him, other things had authority to speak into your life. But now as a Christian, Jesus has the authority over your life and he speaks the truth into who you are. The lies say that you ought to be ashamed because of what you've done. But Romans 8 says, there is now no condemnation, not one piece of condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. The lies say you do not measure up. You don't measure up as a person. But Romans 8.31 says, God gave up everything so that he might win your love. The lie says you're not good enough. You're not good enough. But Exodus 19 verse 5's God truth is that you are my holy people and a treasured possession. The lie says that situation that you're going through, the things you're dealing with, you are alone. Psalm 34 verse 18 says, God says, as a shepherd carries a lamb, so I have carried you close to my heart. See, lies are powerful. Jesus says, I am the truth. Let me speak into your life. Don't go there, there, and there for something else. Come to me. And we can find his truth in his word. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. A challenging quote. What one generation finds optional, the next generation will find unnecessary. This isn't just about feeding ourselves with the truth for now, but we are modeling for the next generation. If we are flippant with our Bible study, if we are flippant with our relationship with God, then how can we expect our children to find it unnecessary? So do you need to make an adjustment this morning? Are there people who are speaking into your life who really shouldn't be? Are you consuming content that really is speaking lies into your life? Have you been believing a lie this morning? Because Jesus wants to set you free. He will cut that lie off and he will speak in its place truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And lastly, Jesus says, I am the life. You know, when we are troubled and the disciples here, they were troubled. It says their hearts. We're vulnerable to turning to other things for our life to give us life, to help us feel life. But Jesus said, I have come that you will have life in fullness and abundance. There is a strong temptation, and I know it because I feel it myself. As a parent, 
with a family, with a future ahead, to try and want to need, and need to control every part of my life. Create my own safety to be in charge. It's less risky that way. It makes sense. If I can create my own life, I can put my trust for my future into my pension. I can put my trust in my investments, in money, in my career, in other people, all great stuff and absolutely wise. I read a verse the other day that said, it is a wise man who leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. Great biblical encouragement for us to be wise with what we're doing with our stuff. Not just for ourselves, not just for our children, but for our children's children. But if that ends up being everything and this idea of controlling my life comes so hard and our fists tense up, it becomes so hard to receive the life that God is trying to give us. I had a really sad picture. <laughs> I had a sad picture when thinking about this. And um, yeah, you know the game Musical Chairs? I'll just bring this up. <laughs> We're not going to play it. <laughs> but I had a picture of playing Musical Chairs. And you're down to the last seat. And there's always two people competing. And it's like, for someone here, I just think for someone here, it's like you're playing musical chairs for the throne of your life. Who will be in control? And you're running around and the music's playing and the other person running around with is Jesus. And the music stops and you rush to the seat. Boom. And Jesus has rushed in, but you've shimmied him out of the way. And you think, hey, I've won. I have won the game for my life. I'm in control. And you turn your head. And you see the Prince of Peace, who is love personified, on the floor next to you. And he's looking up at you. You think you've won. Jesus says, I will let you make your own life. I will give you control of your own life. But if you would let me, if you would let me have control, I will give you life in fullness, in abundance, beyond what you think you can conjure up for yourself. There will be joy. There will be freedom. There will be a deep inner peace. There will be security. But if we hold on too tightly, you will never receive. Jesus is the life, not just because he gives life, but because he brings life into your relationship with God. Thomas in this passage in John 14, he says, we don't know where you're going, Lord. How can we follow you? Tell me the route. Tell me the plan. Tell me the future. Tell me where. You're, tell me where. And Jesus says, but you know me. On the road to Emmaus, after Jesus dies and he has resurrected, he's walking, he's making a journey between two towns. And on this path, he encounters two people walking. And he walks with them. And he talks with them. He's real. He's alive. And he spends some time with them. They break bread. He stays with them. And then he leaves. And in reflection upon their time walking with Jesus, they say, were not our hearts burning within us while he walked with us and talked with us on the road? Jesus said, I am the way. 
I am the way for you to have an open door for a relationship with God that will transform you and change you, not just in this life, but forever. That I am the truth. I will speak into your life. Truth. I am who I am. He says, I am the life. I will give you life in abundance. And I want to be your closest friend. See, we can know about God. But knowing God is different. Jesus lived. Jesus lives. He loves. He walks. And he talks with us. You can be close to him. You can be intimate with Jesus as the closest friend, not just as a concept or not just as someone up here, but someone who is so close to you, walking with you every single day. This is the encouragement. You're not left alone. And as you become closer in proximity and closer in intimacy to Jesus, your hearts will be set on fire. I've changed my prayer recently from, Lord, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it, to, Lord, I want to know you. And let me tell you, it changes your day, changes your week. All of a sudden, things which seem to matter so much don't matter so much anymore. When you are intimate with the Father in Jesus who has given everything for you, who walks and talks with you, everything changes. It will help you to be a better husband. It will help you to be a better wife. It will help you to be a better parent, a better neighbor, a better friend. You can make better decisions. We don't have to be tough and take it all on our shoulders. We are not the way. We are not the truth. We are not the life. He is. So you don't have to be. This is what Jesus promised when we walk with him. Freedom. Joy, a lightness of the spirit. Very quickly, is there any runners in the room? Anyone into running, fitness? Oh man, no one? <laughs> yes, Mark, brilliant. There's a few, there's a few. Maybe you're just modest and you don't want to say well, there's, if you um, look at any of the elite marathon runners, some of the, the peak athletes um, in the world, they will most likely tell you that their training plan, um, you might think that to get fitter, like they just blast out workout after workout after workout, and they push themselves to the limit all the time to get better and better and better. But most elite athletes and runners follow the 80-20 rule, where 20% of their training is done at a high threshold level. Like they are pushing, it is hurting, they are sweating, and it is, you know, it's like, I want to stop, I want to stop, I want to stop. But 80% of their training is done at what they call a conversational pace. It's where I'm exerting low to moderate effort at best, but I can still keep a conversation with you. I'm not out of breath, I'm not gassed, I'm not dying, I'm not waiting for this horror to end, but I can talk. I wonder if sometimes we can live our lives and get these things out of balance with Jesus. Where we are living 20% of our life at a conversational pace with him. And 80% is like just balls to the wall and get this done and the next and the next and the next. But the road to Emmaus is an encouragement to slow down and walk with him, talk with him. I 
And all of this is capped off in the most amazing promise for all of us. I'm very aware that in this room, some people are closer to the end of their lives than others. Jesus says to his disciples, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to create a place for you, I will surely come back and get you. Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life isn't just about a personal story between you and him. There is a much bigger story that he has unfolded here. A story that goes for generations and for all peoples. He is preparing a place for you. It is stored up. It's not something that can be stolen. It's not something that moths can destroy. But there is a place for you. And he will surely come and take you and get you. So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Praise God because you don't have to be. So don't try to be. Receive that. And there's freedom. I wonder if, as we finish now, I'm in a minute, we're going to just have a song playing on the, on the screen. And I would, might invite you to sing if you want. But I want to know, because today as we're speaking about Jesus being the way, there may be some people here who do not know Jesus as the way in their life. Like maybe you've been coming along to church. Maybe you've done an alpha course. Maybe you've had questions, but you've never accepted Jesus for yourself, that he would want to cancel this mess and this barrier between you and God, that he would invite you into a living relationship with him. I did it when I was 23 years old fully, and I had been controlling my life and trying to live the way I wanted to, and it was tough, and I was striving, and I couldn't see a way of changing. And I opened my heart up and I said, I'm done with living my life. Because when I live my life my way, I run it into the ground. And I didn't just open my life up to a concept or a thought or some great moral ideas, but it was to a person. The person of Jesus who said, I will cut away the mess and the barrier between you and me. For some people, it's like you're walking it's a bit like walking with a chain behind me just towards the edge of a cliff. I said, I will cut it off if you receive me. The relationship can be repaired. I'd just like to pray if we could close our eyes for a moment. And maybe this is speaking to you it's my words coming out of my mouth. But I believe Jesus wants to use this to speak to your heart. Have you been carrying around what feels like a chain and a heavy ball behind you? And you've heard all this great stuff about how God can change people's lives, but it's not happened for you. And if there's something in your heart today that says, I want that, I want you, then would you just pray in your heart this prayer with me? It's not about saying magical words. It's not about a set phrase that is going to unlock the key. But it's your heart's position. Lord Jesus. thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life.
I realize that in my life, I've been in control. I realize that in living the life my way, there is now a barrier between you and I. I can't get that barrier down. But I know you can. So I want to say sorry. Because I've lived my life my way. And although I may be a bit scared about what the future holds, I want to put my trust in you. Well, Jesus, would you come into my life I accept your forgiveness. Amen.